Formalities. My name is Ed Clendenin. and I'm with the uh, 376 Veterans Bond Group, and I'm talking with uh, Mr. James Seipert. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Spell your name just for the record, please. Yeah, my name is Jim. It's James, but I'm known as Jim Seibert, S-I-B-E-R-T. Okay. And uh, you were uh, one of the original members of the um, HALPRO detachment? That's correct. Okay. Uh, could you start off with... Uh, did you enlist? Were you were you drafted or how well, did you I, I graduated from college in 1940 at Anderson uh, University, which is near Ball State, and uh, they will have one of these traveling Air Force units coming around. Actually, it was a medical group <clears throat> trying to interest people in going into pilot training, and uh, so I went into uh, enlisted and. Um, as a flying cadet, that was a flying cadet program there, and I took CPT, that civilian pilot training at Anderson College then, and uh, so I knew I liked to fly, so I signed up, and I reported in and entered the service on in October the 12th of 1940, 40, that's it, 1940, and then I was uh, called up for my primary training and. uh I went to Sykes and Missouri and Randolph Field for basic and then over to uh, Brooksville for advanced. And I, at that time, you could ask for the type of flying you wanted. And I asked for heavy bombardment. You could also ask for the base. This was before Pearl Harbor, of course. And uh, I asked for Langley Field, and I got McDill at Tampa, Florida, which was a new base, and which was it turned out well. So... Uh, I was there at uh, McDill Field, and I was in the first and the 44th bomb group there, and then was transferred over into the 98th, and was there for a while, checked out in B-18s, and also checked out in B-17. We didn't have the 24s yet. That was the consolidated uh, four-engine bomber. <clears throat> and um, then finally, before leaving McDill, I checked out in the uh, B-24s. They brought in some new ones there, just from the factory. And then uh, I was down at McDill, uh, not at McDill, but at Fort Myers, Florida, for uh, they brought the 98th down there, and then they brought in uh, the beginning of the uh, chief officials or officers, high officers in the HAL Pro. They came in from Wright-Patterson Field, and they, so they turned the... 98th Bomb Group, this is interesting, I think, and Colonel Rush, that was the uh, commanding officer of the 98th, they relieved him of command of the 98th when Halverson came down to Fort Myers, and that was Colonel How Harry H. Halverson, uh, Harry A. Halverson, I guess it is, but uh, they gave him command, they released Rush of the 98th, gave it over temporarily to uh, uh, Halverson and Halverson picked crew members and uh, navigators, his officers, and everything out. Also, the enlisted personnel there for 23 crews, and um, so that was done. And then when they selected them all and got the planes too from the 98th, uh, they turned the command of the 98th back to Rush, and uh, also. Uh, then Halverson had his HAL Pro group established, and that was the beginning of HAL Pro. Okay. Now, did you? Uh, I, I, I assume Halverson picked picked the pilot first, so he would have picked you. Right. It, well, what did Halverson, of course, was in charge of the group, but I think Colonel Fellman and uh, uh, later Colonel Fellman, he was Lieutenant Colonel then, and another individual, I think um, Captain Sanders interviewed them all, and the main thing that, as I understand, they were looking for was fellows that uh, were good pilots, and then uh, also fellows that had a sense of humor. And a sense of humor, I see. But that's right, because we, we were going, we didn't know what our plans were. These plans were secret at that time. Sure. And uh, later on, we found out that that was the process they used, because they knew we were going over to to uh, China and operate out of a forward Chinese base and bomb Tokyo. Right. And uh, they figured that some of us would land up in concentration camps and stuff, and they wanted fellows that had a sense of humor and could take it. And, ah. 
So they they didn't want anybody. It was too serious minded, I guess. I see. Now your <laughs> your co-pilot was Dick Miller, correct? Dick Miller, and I understand. I t- I just found out on Memorial Day. I called out to uh, his home and I asked if Dick was there, and his wife informed me that he died in 2004, and uh, he had quite a bit of uh, medical practice, uh, not practice, but medical. Uh, problems before he died, uh-huh. but he, she, and I asked her. I said, "Well, why wasn't this put into publication that he deceased long ago?" She said, "Well, he always contributed to uh, organizations and uh, 376 and other bomb groups and to for money, you know." And she said he'd always spend it, send it. She said, "I just kept up when he died, and if, there, if something had come in asking for a donation, I'd do it." So he was kept in the uh, book and he was never listed as deceased oh well i but I'll, not, I'll have to list him then beg your pardon i said i will have to put his name well in the, i'll tell you that's already been done i call oh, it the, has okay yeah i call the uh secretary of the outfit out in uh leroy leroy uh, lapham lapham okay yeah I called him and told him about it and gave him the date of death oh okay so that's been done Okay. And well, then my only other two, we, these were seven man crews, incidentally. Com- uh huh. Pilot, co pilot, navigator, bombardier combined. Right. And then you had your radio operator and your engineer and your armors and tail gunner. And right. Now, when did, uh, when were you linked up with uh, Dick Miller to become a crew or start the crew? Well, did- that was in uh, May of. Uh, 19, well, it was before May, I guess it was about April, because we stayed at Fort Myers and went up to Wright-Patterson getting supplies and everything. Now, did you pick him, or did, no, or did no. somebody assign him to you? Well, they just, they assigned, yeah, they, these crews were assigned. Okay. After they were picked, they put them together. I don't know who, but the higher officers were that and I, our group was command. Uh, I was a B flight commander. Right. But the senior officer on my crew going over was Lieutenant Colonel Fellman, and uh, he was just listed as a passenger because they didn't want him to fly any combat because of his engineering ability and everything, and they knew it was going to be needed over there. Now, was he a rated pilot? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay, but he just wasn't allowed to fly missions. Oh, yeah. In fact, we alternated on takeoffs and landings going across at different uh, stops. Ah, okay. Okay, so uh, sometime in late April, Halverson yeah, well, shows we, up. We, and... Well, we, we, we trained. We had three crews of uh, – two crews of eight and one of seven. We had uh, 23 crews that we ended up with that was going to start this – tour overseas going the South Atlantic route. Uh-huh. And we, we took turns leaving Fort Myers going down to right to uh, uh, Morrison Field at West Palm Beach. And we left a day apart there when we, we they told us that uh, A flight had been cleared out while B flight took off from Fort Myers went to uh, Morrison Field and then we uh, that was the last stop there and then we went to Puerto Rico and Trinidad and on down the South Atlantic route. Uh huh. So uh, we went over that way as uh, three groups: A, uh, flight A, B, and C. And, right. Uh, the same way we took off from the Dallas Brazil at about nine at night, different nights, and uh, went over there and uh, flew all night. And I see the sun pop right up out of the middle of the Atlantic. Ascension wasn't even open then. So it was a 15-hour flight going across with 3,100 gallons of gas, and you flew cruise control charts so that you could throttle back and save your fuel. You know, right. when you got halfway out, more than half your fuel was gone. So uh, then you were losing. You were past the halfway point. That's right. That was the point of no return there. Either. Right. So now we're. So there were eight planes in your. Uh, eight. Sec- Eight planes in A, and I think there were seven. I don't. I don't recall which one seven was in, but uh, I think they originally wanted to plan for twenty-four, but from there or another, they ended up with twenty-three. Right. Now, did all did, then? Did all eight planes in your particular group fly together? No, in, in no. Formation? no, 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 no. We uh, these were individual flights. We went to to uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, from there to Trinidad, to uh, Natal, Brazil. 
And uh, then from Vital, we took off at nine at night, individual flights, and uh, going across, you didn't see anybody. And then when sun up came up, you could see these spots in the sky there that was uh, other planes in your flight of eight, you know. Uh-huh. And uh, did you maintain radio silence then? Oh yeah, we did going across. I mean, we you know, and because we were near, we we couldn't go into uh, Robertsville or Vichy French territory, so we had to go in down at Accra because that was a Nazi, you know. Right, they were the enemy. Yeah, right. Okay, so, so now we went, went across there, and uh, on that one interesting thing on that flight, when I asked my navigator about five hours out from Africa, I said, uh, Dutch, I said, give me, and we, Dutch Ebert, I said, give me an ETA, and I said, just a rough one, I said, because I want to figure gasoline here and consumption and so he gave me a, and he missed his ETA by two minutes, five hours out. So well, that's, that's kind that's of pretty navig- bad. These navigators were from the top third of their navigation classes uh-huh. on Halpro, and uh, they they and some of the enlisted guys they took were key men too. You know, it was a select group. Right. So when you um, all the planes, I guess if I, if I remember what uh, Dutch said, ended up in Khartoum. That's right. We we went to to a crawl, okay. And then we the next flight was in Khartoum, and that was a real nasty flight. That was we hit weather there that was uh, thunderstorms and stuff for miles, and you couldn't go around it, couldn't go over it. You just had to go through it on instruments. And wow! It was uh, bouncing you around and uh, lightning, and uh, I was talking with Dutch, and he thought that was on the flight going across from a. Natal to Africa, but I might check my diary, and it's definitely the flight from uh, Accra to Khartoum. Khartoum. So you were already into Africa when that oh, happened. Oh yeah, yeah. Now and you mentioned flew over you... one section of Africa there, where the tribesmen, where they really were savages, uh-huh. and uh, so they said, "Don't land if you if you got problems, some mechanical or something. Try to get up beyond that section." You know. Sure. I, re- I think there was another Hal Pro gentleman was telling me that when they landed, I don't know if it was a Khartoum or not, but he said that there were a bunch of natives standing around the field with spears when, when he landed, and then he was told. I, th- I think that's so- somebody that they didn't get into Khartoum. I think they landed just before that. Ah, okay. But I'm not now. Don't quote me on that, but I mean, uh, I think is my recollection. Okay, that's but that what, was that did not happen to your or your plane. No, it didn't happen to mine, and it wasn't anybody in uh, Flight B, I know Okay, because he commented that they asked what were the spears for, and they said to keep the lions away. And, yeah. And, and, and he said, here he was out, out there with his 145 pistol yeah. <laughs> protecting his airplane from, from lions. And yeah. <laughs> he said that was, that was pretty yeah, scary. Well, you were going into wild country, all right. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so you mentioned that uh, you were going to go over to ch- to China, to bomb Japan. Yeah, we they didn't tell us this. I mean, we had, when we left Morrison Field at West Palm Beach, on one of the crews, they had a Chinese general. That was Wang? Was that his name? Beg your pardon? I said I was trying to remember if his name was Wang or something like that. I think like that's that. it now that you mention it, yeah. Okay. But anyway, when we got over there, the, found out we were there. We sat there at Khartoum for two weeks. Really? Uh, what, okay. What's the deal? You know, where are we going? And the word came back that the Japanese had overrun this forward base in China and got all our bombs, fuel, ammunition, and everything. So that scrapped that that mission. I mean, and then we ended up going on the mission up to Ploesti, right. June, June the 11th of 42. And that one turned out to be the one where the first American bombers, American bombs were dropped in the European theater. Right. Now, um... When they sent you up to uh, to um, Egypt or Fayed, I guess is the base you flew out of. Yeah, Fayed. 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 Yeah. Fayed. Now, you so you already knew that China wasn't going to happen for you. What, what did they tell you was going to, you were going to fly with the RAF? Were you going to? Did no, they tell you what you were going to do? They didn't. That, that's the thing that uh, see Halverson was carrying secret orders. Uh huh. And uh, we sat around. We didn't know what was going to be. So. I think the way this worked out, you had that tremendous pressure up there on the Russian front, and uh, 
the uh, Air Force up there, the German Luftwaffe and everything. So they wanted to pull some of those out of that. And we had enough range to get up from uh, Fayette up to uh, Ploesti. Right. With 3,100 gallons of gas, two Bombay tanks and Uh wing tanks. And um, so I think one reason was even though they briefed us on, the British briefed us on the weather and everything, and it's going to be clear and all, and we got within about 80 miles of that, and we hit a front that was about 11,000 thick. And uh, so our original instructions was don't go down, stay at altitude. But here was a bunch of gung-ho guys that uh, weren't uh, – we were over there to start the war. And so uh, I think everybody – not everybody, but a lot of them went down. And my plane broke out right over Bucharest, Romania. Uh-huh. And that was the headquarters of the German Air Force. And uh, due to the weather, they couldn't get up and fly the pursuit, you know, on instruments and stuff. So we popped right back up into the clouds and uh, – started heading up towards Ploesti because we recognized we had a ident there on uh, Bucharest. Right. But that uh, thing, uh, you had icing in those clouds, and uh, we had uh, the uh, oxygen freeze and the tail turret, and two guys, uh, their oxygen masks froze up, and had to send my co-pilot back to... Uh, Minister portable auction bottle to them, get them going again. Uh-huh. And here I was flying instruments, icing conditions, and adjusting throttles and turbo superchargers and everything there. So I was uh, kept kind of busy there. For yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> and I got we got up on top, and boy, we had clear ice. It looked, it looked like the plane had been shellacked. Wow. And what uh, I'll tell you, I'll think back, and I think, why in the world didn't we stall? Uh, but uh, we got on top, and the sun hit us then, and then we started back for home. Now, did you, so you never did find Ploesti, if I no, remember right? No, we we hit a pumping station out there, one of the pumping stations out there, and we bombed it and uh-huh. hit it. And uh, but that wasn't the main refinery. Uh, sure. Uh, and it's a good thing because I guess they had those, you know, on that August 1st, 43 mission, when they went in at low level, they had broad balloons and cables and right. stuff and everything. So, well, And, of course, we alerted the Air Force when we came in there over Bucharest. But uh, luckily, if it had been decent weather, they probably would have got enough of those pursuits up in the 109s and Folkwolf 190s up in the air that we probably wouldn't have got back. There was There seems to be some... Uh, I don't want to use the word controversy, but whether or not any of the other airplanes ran into German fighters, did, did that ever? Did any of the other well, crews we ever were, say we, were, we ran into German fighters on? Oh, you we, did. When we got back, yeah, we got hit by six Me 109s, we, and uh, that time we were over water, uh-huh. and uh, we got right down on the deck, and where they had couldn't get dive down, you know had to peel off ahead of us and where it gives us a chance to shoot them. And we got one of the 109s. Now, was this on that first mission or on a yeah, later on mission? Yeah, on this first mission. On the first a, mission, okay. That was, that was the first uh, uh, air-to-air gunnery, I mean, where they lost a plane, I mean. Really? In the European war, yeah, I mean. Who was the gunner who got it? Do you remember? I don't even remember that. I, uh, so, but this was your first mission? No, no, wait a minute. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm ahead of myself. This was the one on the Italian fleet. Okay. Next, second mission. Second mission. So we, okay. no, none of us got hit by anything on the... Uh, on the first? On the first mission, yeah. No interceptions because of that weather and stuff. And then uh, Dutch, I think, said you went to Aleppo to refuel? Uh, Aleppo. Aleppo. Yeah. Now, Aleppo, that's kind of interesting because... Uh, it meant a lot difference in my life because otherwise I'd have spent six months in Turkey. At, uh, oh, one of the internees. Yeah, but four crews went into. Uh, I'm trying to think of the anchor. Uh, not An- Ankara. Anchor, Ankara. Uh, yes. Ankara, Turkey. Yeah, uh, and uh, of course they briefed us on the briefing. They told us before we left on that mission, the British. Had, they said that you'll. Uh, here's a phone number. You call this number if you go into Ankara. And uh, they'll have you gassed up. Now, of course, Turkey was a neutral country. Right. And they'll have you gassed up and out of there. And 
von Papen, I think was the guy's name, was the German ambassador there. And uh, he knew what was going on, and probably through their intelligence, they knew that we'd been up in the Ploesti area. Uh-huh. So they got a, those guys were interned for six months. Right. But I, to say what I happened, I said to Dutch, I said, Dutch, which is the closest? I said, we've got a fuel problem. I said, Aleppo, Syria, or uh, Ankara, Turkey. And he said, well, he said, let me plot it here. And he said, well, Aleppo is a little closer. I said, well, let's take that. Now then, that's a story, too. We came in there, and uh, as we were approaching Aleppo, looked out in front of us, and here was big runways. It looked like LaGuardia Airport. Uh huh. And we got down there, and here we saw little specks on the runway, and there were 50-gallon oil drums filled with sand on all the runways that hadn't even been opened yet. You couldn't have landed a Piper Cub in between those things. Huh. Here we were out of fuel, and I said to Dutch, I said, Dutch, he, I, he said, Cy, he said, you heard in the briefings, too. He said, they told us, he said, well, I'll tell you. He said, try this, and he gave me a heading up a little ways there. And, and I had the crew, we were just up, about out of gas, and I told the crew, I said, prepare for uh, uh, emergency landing. I said, we're going in wheels down if I can find a place where there's not too many rocks and stuff. Right. But I said, prepare for a rough landing. And I was looking out over my left, and I just happened to see a British truck there with the RAF insignia, the round circles, you know. Right. And uh, here beside it was a little strip about 2,000, just used a bulldozer to clean it off, about 2,000 feet long. Of course, I was light, no gas, and and no bombs. So uh, I came in and said, I told him, I said, well, good. I said, we're going to get in here if I can set this thing in this distance. So we landed and uh, used brakes, but it, we did get it stopped. And uh, so another one of our planes was flown by Captain uh, Wilkinson. Uh-huh. It came in, too. So we had two crews that landed there at uh, Aleppo, and uh, um, they, they went into... Uh, Brit RAF took the guys into town to a hotel there and fed, got them fed and everything. I was so dead tired uh, on oxygen at that time, and then we flew over Turkey with no oxygen at 12,000 feet because we wanted to save it for high altitude operation up in Ploesti. Right. And I was just beefed. I, they had a bed there with this mosquito bar and everything, and I laid down across. That didn't take off my flight uniform or anything. And I was sleeping, and I said, I look so tired, they didn't even bother to wake me to take me to eat. And I slept there the whole night. And, but that was, I thought, well, if combat doesn't kill me, these, <laughs> these missions will. <laughs> <laughs> so you so you refueled the next day and then took flew yeah, back? We had to hand pump gas. They had gasoline there and some old drums that was beginning to rust. And we had to chamois our gas had to hand pump it out of those drums up into the wings. Uh-huh. And we put in 600 gallons and went on back then to uh, Fayette. Now did were you uh did the the guys that remained back at Fayette did they know who would land in Turkey or who or were they just waiting? We we found that out when we got back to Fayette. Okay. And we lost some ships, I think uh four ships around Ramadi. Ramadi Iraq and of course that's been in the news here with this Iraqi war, you know? Right. And, but that's that was a British base there, and uh, uh, oh wait a minute, I'm getting this mixed up with another. Well, I know four ships went to, were um, four went, ships went to down Turkey. at Ramadi, Ramadi, yeah. And then another ship crashed. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, so I don't we, remember which one. With out of the uh, tw- thirteen ships, or twenty three ships, we lost some right out of that first mission, you know. Yeah. Four interned in Turkey and others that were. Mark, Mark, the guy's name was Moody. Mark Moody. Mark Moody, yeah. He was out of fuel and his. I think was Mark, in... is, Mark is still living. I think. Really. Yeah, as far as I know, I uh, talked to him a couple of years ago. I guess it was. Do you have a phone number for him? I could get one here. Let's see. Hold on. I've got a directory. Let me just take a minute. Yeah, here you are. Okay. Mark, M-A-R-K-T, Moody, M-O-O-T-Y. Right. And uh, 
he lives down in Niceville, Florida, down here, and his phone number I have now is area code 850-857-8970. Oh one six seven. Okay. Because yeah. I know he's not a member of the so at least he wasn't a member according to my latest roster. Was a member of what? Was not a member of the of the Veterans Association. Yeah. So but anyway. Yeah, but that this is a directory out of the three seventy six Oh. The uh, Blue Book Blue Book was put out in uh let's see, uh two thousand one, two thousand two oh. roster. Okay, well yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, so back to your. So you guys finally then returned the next day. <clears throat> yeah, and then we weren't. This first mission was on June the 11th of 42. Right. And they said, "Well, get prepared for another mission," and that was an Italian fleet mission that was on. Uh, well, let's see, that was June the 15th, I believe. 15th. You're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was one where Dutch said they they had painted the battleship the decking in bright red and white. They what? That the Italians had painted the decking red and white. I don't remember that, but um, I do remember that on going out on that, we had some British, uh, I think two British liberators. With you? LB-30s. Right. That were with the RAF that were on our, with our crew group. At, uh, I don't know how many of our went out there. I think there were five... I'd Five have, planes went. Yeah, I'd have it in my uh, diary, I guess, but there was that, not too many. Right. Because we were uh, mechanical failures and those in turn crashed and everything. So that's all like get ready in flying condition for this Italian fleet mission. But we were going out and uh, we had an, a, a, a RAF guy, one of them is one of the, one along on one of the ships was navigating. And uh, there was a big convoy out there, and uh, so they got pretty close to it, but it had turned out to be a British convoy, and they let us know it with some anti-aircraft fire. Uh-huh. Luckily, none of it was hit, but, boy, we identified ourselves with, I think, very pistols, you know, the colors of the day, and um, got away from them and let them go. And we went on then and hit the Italian fleet coming out of Toronto. Uh-huh. And uh, that was a good flight. Uh, we got hit some battleships, and they turned. You know, this this convoy was going out. The reason we were after it was it was Malta was just starved out. They hadn't been able to get any shipping in there at all. The British, and uh, so uh, this there was a big convoy co- headed for Malta, and a British convoy with supplies and everything. And they said, uh, if you can damage that fleet enough to keep it from getting in there, why well, that's your mission. Uh-huh. So we we did enough damage to them, and they turned around and went back to Toronto. And the uh, Italian, the uh, British convoy, we got into Malta and everything, so we accomplished our mission. Oh. And uh, that was the one that, on the way back, and uh, uh, we were over water and got hit by six. ME 109s and got one of them. Uh huh. But we got right. We, you know, we were green in combat, but we figured they took us right down. Colonel Calbert was leading this. Uh, I guess it was Major Calbert at that time. Yeah. Uh huh. He, he went way up. He went down to Bomber Command later on and went way up in rank. But he had been an old KLM pilot and been around the world, and so uh, he was a good leader. You know. Uh huh. But uh, then we came back. That was the second mission. And then after that, we were flying up to Benghazi and Tobruk, which were ports for Rommel's Eighth Army. You know where they were coming across from Naples and stuff. To, right. And the ships supplying uh, fuel and bombs and everything else. So that's that part of it. Now, any other questions you want? Well, I'll try to answer. Okay. Now, well, how many? In total, how many missions did you fly? I flew 32 missions, uh, 302 combat hours. It was, but our missions were so, just like you know, I, I talk over here where I'm living now. There's guys here that flew pursuit over there in England and P-47s and stuff. Well, they had those short missions, but our missions would uh, we're going up across to, to Naples and those places, 
and we went up to Seuss and Sfax there in North Africa. Uh-huh. And uh, good night. The 10 and 12 hour missions weren't, uh, you'd just take off at, uh, in the afternoon, you know, the, from Africa. And you'd get up there to try to hit Naples about uh, dusk so that the pursuit couldn't stay out too late because night landings and stuff. Right. And uh, so those that's the reason you could figure that 302 and 32 missions, it averages almost, out about 10-hour yeah, missions. Yeah, almost 10 hours of mission. Yeah. And I, I'll tell you another thing out of those I want to point out. We were over in this war so early that out of the 32 missions I flew on, not one of them did I ever fly it where we had any pursuit escort. They couldn't stay with us. They couldn't go that far, you know. Sure, and there were no bases forward bases. So, so you relied on your own firepower when you got intercepted by ME-109s. We got hit by Focal 190s up at Seuss there. So uh, you were on your own. Uh-huh. So when when was your last mission? Uh, let me see. I can t- tell you. Hold on. Sure. I think. Let's see. Major Cyber. That's one hundred. Yeah, here it is. Uh, my last mission was to uh, Naples, Italy, on March the first, nineteen forty-three. March the 1st? Yeah, March the 1st, 1943. That was up to the Naples. Naples, yeah, and I led that mission. Okay. Um, what did you do after your last mission? Well, we um, got orders to come home, and several of us. Uh huh. And um, we got on a Pan American uh, flying boat at Fisher's Lake, Africa, there. And uh, that was interesting, too. That was a night takeoff there. We we were up there and uh, got on this Pan-American ship, and he had one day, it was a night, dark night, and he taxied down the, in the lake there, back downwind to stir up the water so it would break the suction on his floats when he took off, you know. Uh-huh. And uh, just before he started his takeoff run, they fired a big, very, a big parachute up in the air with a flare on it, and that lit up the whole lake, and he took off, and that was his lights for seeing the trees and the other stuff there. And we came back then to, uh, I stopped off at, uh, trying to think where for an engine change, at uh, one of the South American countries, I forget which it was, but we got that change and then came on into uh, a Pan American base there at New York. And on our appro- that's another thing. On our approach into New York, we were coming in there, and uh, we were about 50 miles out, and the male steward come around pulling all the shades down. Well, that didn't scare us, so we raised them up, and the plane started circling. And come to find out afterwards that they spotted a German sub there that was out waiting for an American convoy coming out, a naval convoy. So they couldn't uh, contact the uh, flying boat, couldn't contact the naval uh, convoy. So they radioed into New York and told them to get a hold of the Pan American frequency and have them tell them about this sub out there. Uh huh. And uh, so, so I don't know what happened after that, but that's what that was. This is in um, May of '43. Uh, so that was probably right when the U-boats were. Yeah. Trying to sink American freighters. Yeah. And then when we got into, we got in there and went and got a hotel. We were, um, got a cab first from uh, out there, and uh, the cab driver was driving us in there, and some guy cut him out, and he come out with some oaths, you know, and we said, well, we know we're home. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> We put up this hotel, and we went in there, and uh, it was black, everything blacked out, you know. Sure. So one of the guys goes up there where you sign in and pulls out his Zippo lighter and is holding it and signing his name. And <laughs> one of these women, the air raid wardens, come up, and she says, don't you know there's a war going on? He says, tell me about it, lady. He says, I'm just back from combat. <laughs> <laughs> 
So what, what did, where, did, where did the military send you after your missions? Well, then we went to, uh, I went to Salt Lake City, the 18th replacement wing. Uh-huh. And uh, was there, and uh, I had about a nice, I was married. I got married, after, I got home on the 5th of May, and I'm married the 12th. But we'd been engaged the whole time, but I figured it was too big a risk to be married to leave and go over, you know, and leave a widow in case it didn't come back. So you were engaged when you went over, but then then got married when you got back. That's right, yeah. Yeah. So they sent you to Salt Lake? Salt Lake City, yeah, an 18th replacement wing. And I say that was kind of a nice honeymoon a year later, I mean, uh, because of we, I'd call in every morning, I'd say, any orders from Major Cybert, and they'd say, nothing today. And so you'd get in your car and drive out to Salt Lake or someplace and look around, you know, and till the next morning. And finally sure. then called up, and they said, well, you're going to Mountain Home, Idaho. And uh, I visited trees and streams and everything. No, and Mountain Home's flat. That, that didn't turn out that way. <laughs> I, I lived in Idaho for a while. It's flat near there. Yeah, yeah. So were you like an instructor pilot or? Well, uh, first of all, first of all, I didn't go right to Mountain Home, but I went into Boise because Mountain Home wasn't completed yet. They were still building that base. Right. So they said, okay, they said, uh, we'd like for you to be a flight instructor at night flying, check out some of these guys and their night flying and stuff. And that's what I did until the time to go down. I went down as one of the four new base commanders squadron commanders there at the base. Uh-huh. And I'm trying to think of the designation of that. That was in 4th Air Force. Oh, yeah, it was the uh, 804 bomb squadron. Okay. And uh, But anyway, it was 2nd Air Force. And then we stayed there, and tra- this was a three-stage training for the B-24 pilots. They were training them. They were going out to the Pacific, you know, uh-huh. three phases. And uh, then we were there, and they uh, said that the, down in Tonopah, Nevada, they had uh, smaller aircraft, and with thermal currents and everything down there was giving them problems on landings, and they wanted heavier equipment, so they sent us down to Tonopah, and uh, well, the whole group moved in down there. And uh, still training crews, I mean, that was still sure. second Air Force. Still B-24s? Yeah, still B-24s. Did you oh, I might something else I might tell you too goes sure. goes back, but before I went overseas, when I was at McDill there and I checked out in seventeens, and I also checked out in the twenty fours. They sent uh, four crews up to Wright Patterson Field to service test the new B twenty four Cs that were coming in. Well, I, I've read since about the history of the twenty fours. They only made nine of those things. And we didn't even see a C. When we got up there, they were Ds. Ds, right. And uh, so we, 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 there's where we developed our uh, cruise control charts and everything on missions. We'd top off the fuel, go up and fly it, and come down in an hour, and then take a longer trip and come back and figured out what your fuel consumption was, you know. And we used those charts when we went across the Atlantic. So you were one of the four crews that went up the right. I was path. one of the four, I was one of the four pilots. Yeah, Five, four pilots. Now mm-hmm. Scotty Royce went up there with you too, didn't he? Beg your pardon. Scotty Royce. Royce, yeah, you? yeah, he was up there. Okay. And uh, let's see, D. W. McDonald was a guy that was in the ninety eight. He was up there, and uh, this was all we were in the ninety eight. Then Chris sure. Reuter was another fellow, and myself. I was the only second lieutenant that was. A, Pilots up there. The others were, I think, captains, first lieutenants, and everything. But okay. uh, we flew all kinds of test missions up there, and a lot of bugs and stuff. That we, for example, one of the things was that the cold weather, the uh, hydraulic lines running out on the, underneath the wings, you know, would uh, freeze, and you couldn't. You get ready to take off, have your turbos set, and You'd have one engine going real and another's not, and you'd have to adjust it with throttles and sliding around on frozen top on, the, well, this was in February. So so that, then I came back to McDill, and then the group had moved from there to Barksdale Field in Shreveport, and I joined them over there. And so there was a lot of shuffling and going stuff going around then, but. 
So that must have been all before the Halpro. Oh, yeah, that was all before the Halpro. Okay. Now, um, going back to Wright. Wright uh, Patterson. No, I mean, I I meant going back to uh, the first part of your missions in 42. Brereton and his B-17 showed up in August, I believe. Yeah, they came up from... uh, uh, From India, I believe. India, right, yeah. And what? How did? Uh, obviously, Brereton and Halverson didn't get along. Well, Brereton was—they uh, called him Hotfoot Louis. That was his nickname. Hotfoot Louis. Okay. Yeah. Louis H. Burton. Right. He was a two-star, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And but I wasn't there now when they had. I'd come home already when they had that August first tidal wave. Right. Deal. But they said, from what I understand, they said he stood up in front of a whole group of agents there that he was briefing and not agents. I'm thinking the FBI now, <laughs> but uh, uh, all the four crew members there, and he said, "If not, he said this mission is so important up to Ploesti, he, he said if none of you come back, and you know there are how many ships went up there, 170, yeah, yeah, he said it's worth it. It's worth it. Wow. Yeah, well, makes that, you feel good, I guess. That, that makes you swallow a little hard, you know. That, right. Uh, as I say, I wasn't there, but. Now, when I ran into Brereton one time, I was taking an airplane down to Karachi, India, for re- replacing the nose uh, guns. Uh huh. And another ship came in behind me, and that was when I was at Ramadi. We landed there. Right. And uh, another ship came in behind me, and Brereton come in in a D- DC-3 with his crew the next day, and he said, "I want to talk to the." the uh, uh, senior officer on these two crews, and I was a captain, and the other pilot was first Louis, I think. So I, he I said to me, he says, where are you going with these? I said, well, we told us to go down to Karachi for the depot down there and have it worked on. He said, they can't do it. He says, fly these ships back, he said, and uh, they'll go to take you somewhere else. Well, we ended up down at Eritrea. That was the Gura base, D- right? Douglas, yeah, yes. Gura, and Douglas depot down there. But anyway, uh, the worst landing I've ever had to make <clears throat> was coming back. We were broken oil lead going to Karachi that night, and there was uh, inclement weather down there anyway. It was going to probably be instrument. Uh-huh. And I had lost number three engine with the oil leak it broke and had to feather it and come back in. And we got on the uh, Tigris River there and followed it back up into Ramadi. Uh-huh. I told my radio operator, I says, get on the radio and call the field there and tell them we're coming back, turn our lights on and stuff for us. Well, he couldn't raise anybody. So I came back on three engines and uh, opening cow flaps, and it was hot as could be, the engines were overheating my other three. I had to make three passes to get in there, but it was a moonlight night, thank goodness. But the black runway stood out from the sand, you know. Wow. Okay. But I had to come in. Your approach, you brought you in over a hill there, and you got over that hill. You had to be lined up with the runway to to get in it. Uh-huh. And uh, so I landed, and uh, I was doing fine. I was down in the moonlight shadows. No runway lights. The only thing I had was the lights on my airplane, you know. Right. And I got down those moonlight shadows, and then I started feeling for the ground, you know. And uh, anyway, I dropped in a little bit and got the tail stopped a little bit. But any landing like that at that kind of conditions is a good landing. You any know? landing you're going to walk away from is good. Yeah, right. right. So uh, that 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 was the night we'd come back. And then that next day, I mean, it's when Burton came in and sent us back. So I just wanted to recall those. But that... I've never had a tougher landing in it. Huh. Now you, when, know, you know, and, and we had them overseas now. We operated on one flare path. You know, you just have an APU running one line down there in the desert over in Africa. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, when you're coming in there, you, with one light, you can be cocked up in 45-degree angle. And, and if you've got two of them parallel, you can you level off on them, you know. Right. But uh, I didn't have any lights on that thing, and moonlight <laughs> shadows, too. Pretty hair-raising. I- I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> now, when uh, when Brereton showed up, he had B-17s. Did you, got, did you fly missions with the other B-17s? Well, what they did on that was we were going both to Tobruk and Benghazi, right. two ports. We could go to Benghazi, but the B-17s didn't have the range. Uh-huh. 
And so they had sent a mission of B-17s out to Tobruk, and maybe the same night we'd go to Benghazi, you know. And, but we never flew formation together on any any uh, any of those, as I can recall. I mean, no, I know but, some. And in the Naples, they were that. That's out of the question, you know. They, they so didn't have the range. They didn't have the range. Now, and another thing, here's here's I don't know whether a lot of people realize this or not, but there were more B-24s made during the war than 17s. The yes. B-24, if you'd asked me which would you rather fly, I've flown both of them. I say if I'm going out and get shot up real bad, give me a 17. But if I've got to go a long distance and cruise faster range, I'll take a 24, because that 24, if you got one of the vertical st stabilizers while you were in trouble, you know, it threw your plane off of balance, whereas they could shoot half a tail off a 17, you could still get back with aileron, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I remember uh, you talking about the speed of the, of the 24s. I talking to some of the other veterans, and they would say they, once they got up, relocated up to Italy, and were flying missions out of yeah. Italy, they, mm -hmm. there was a there was a couple B-17 groups, and he said they would, every once in a while, you'd you'd be cu coming up behind a, a 17 group on a return from a mission, and yeah. and they would cut off one of their engines, so they'd be only cruising with three engines, and the whole squadron would fly past the 17s with all four going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that much faster. Yeah. So, um, so I take it when I know there were there were some of the Burton's B seventeen pilots became B twenty four pilots, but, mm -hmm. but but they never asked you to go fly the seventeen, I take it. No, no, they never asked us to fly the seventeen and I'll tell you what happened on the twenty fours, one of the ends the uh uh one of the guys that was killed bailed out, but um the guy was coming back and he they signed him as twenty four and he'd been a seventeen pilot, came up with Burton's. Uh huh. And uh, somewhere or another, they were having trouble on, I forget what it was, one of the, I don't remember just what it was, the gear or what. But anyway, uh, one guy, they had him bail out, and his chute didn't open. And, uh, so, but uh, there was a little difference on those two planes. I mean, I liked the 24s, because when you landed and took off, you got driver sickle gear, you know, and you could see everything in the 17. You had to S them, you know, as you're taxing because right. you're sitting down there and looking up the nose. Yes, the tricycle gear, you're sitting in the back. I mean, on the... Yeah, you're sitting front up there where you've got a view of everything in front right. of you. Okay. Um, let's see, I was trying to think. You were, the name of your plane that you went over on was Queen Bee? Queen Bee, yeah. And that was... A capital B, a B, the capital B, and with marks because we were leader of B flight. That's why we give it the name. Oh, I was going to ask you, how did it get the name? Yeah, so it was because you were the B flight. Leader. B flight leader, yeah. Um, I've never seen a picture of your crew. Do you have a picture of your crew? No, I never. We never got. I should have had one taken there, but never got a picture of the crew. But uh, I've never. Seen I had two crews really. I mean, the original crew of. Number nine, that was Queen B, and then when uh, I didn't mention that, but when uh, Cal Bear, who was the uh, KLM pilot and everything, and uh, Halverson flew with him, you know, right? They called him down to Bomber Command, and I took over his crew then. I mean, and that was when Bernie Rang was the, the group navigator, and I got him then as my navigator. And, so, so Dutch was no longer your navigator then? No, no, not the latter part. And uh, what else was I going to say? I think somebody else had mentioned that when uh, the replacement crew started showing up, uh, what uh, the, the guy named Al uh, Al um, Alphonse? Oh uh, no, excuse me, Al Izzo. He was in. Uh, yeah, he was enlisted. Yeah, he was in uh, Thurman Brown's crew, I believe. But in any yeah, event, news? Thurman Brown. Yeah, yeah, Thurman Brown, right. He he was telling me, I think, that when the replacement crew started showing up, that they broke the crews up. Yeah, they did, and I checked out Dick Miller. As a, they reduced him as the first pilot, and he took over a crew then, too, you know. So you lost your co-pilot? A lot of your co-pilots were checked out of that original Halpo and became first pilots before they came home. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and you also had a uh, uh, half-Indian or full-blooded Cherokee? Oh, uh what was his name? Uh, Beach. 
Oh, wait a minute. The chief was his chief was his nickname. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. I've got it right here. Hold on. Here it is, Tassequa. Tassequa, right. Yeah, that's T-A-H-S-E-Q-U-A-H. Now, he was a pilot, right? He was a co-pilot. Oh, he was a co-pilot. Uh, okay. On the original cruise going over, yeah. He was on. One, he was one of the original HAL Pro guys? Yeah, he was original HAL Pro. Okay. Whatever happened to him? Tassequa, let's see, what? I mean, it's pretty rare for an Indian at that time to be a pilot. Yeah, but I've got deceased here. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. Combat. Uh, I got here Korea. Oh, Korea. So I don't know what. Now, my co-pilot, Filippi, uh, not my co-pilot, but my tail gunner to Filippi, he went in the, went to flying school afterwards and was in a B-29 accident in the States and was killed, too. Yeah, he was the one that got hit on the neck, if I remember Dutch was telling me. On one of, he was injured. On, he was shot. When you guys were jumped by fighters, and one of your no, like, no, that that guy, I mean, was killed. Well, I don't know if he was killed or not. He said he was. Um... Well, look, one one of the missions we went up to, I think, was Seuss. Okay. But a piece of flak came down. It came down, you know, that came through the window and caught him. He was, he had. That's an irony of the thing. He had switched with the pilot. Uh, the the pilot was sitting over in the co-pilot seat on this mission. He was letting his co-pilot. Oh, Edmonds. What? Edwards. Edmonds. Edmonds. That's right. Yeah. He was. Yeah. He was. Um, but I was thinking of Felipe. He was your tail gunner, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't. He wasn't. He. Hit? He was never never injured on any flight of mine. And okay. Uh, well, maybe he was. He was flying with somebody else's. Dutch have, was telling me about it. But anyway. May have been. Yeah. But so anyway, so Meech, um, you think died in Korea. Well, that's, that's, that's what I've got there. Now, okay. where I got that, I don't know. I've got two lists, or I've got one list of the whole HAL Pro group uh, by uh, rank, you know, and uh-huh. all of them. And then, and then I've got another one listing all the crews. Okay. And that's where I got this uh, Tassiqua on it. Uh, okay. He was on uh, Warsh's tub. At, oh, okay. Uh, Captain Warsh, he's dead now. Um uh, was ended up as major. Waltz flew a tour with uh, the Americans over in the Eighth Army, uh, not Eighth Army, but over in England. Oh, Eighth Air Force. Yeah, and he said he hated every bit of it. He said, uh, compared with he's flying with uh, 376, you know. Huh. It was a different group because I mean we over there and first guys, you know, first, I remember the first time we went into Cairo, a lot of go in there, we were in uniform, and you'd be looking in the window, and you'd turn around to leave, and everybody's standing around and looking at you, looking you over, you know, because they'd never seen any Americans. Americans. Hmm. Whatever, uh, Queen Bee, whatever happened to it, the plane? Uh, I want to tell you something. Okay. This is interesting. There were two planes in Halpro that were on that uh Tidal wave. Yes. In other words, original planes and that went on the first mission. I don't know whether they went on the first mission or not. But uh, and I'm trying to think where have I got that. But the Queen Bee was one of them. It flew it flew on it flew on the tidal mission mission. Ah. Okay. And it also I mean it flew on the Ploeste, which was the first. So it flew on. Now I don't remember which the other ship was, but there were just two out of the 23 original HAL Pro planes that were still around to fly that uh, August the 1st, 43 mission. Okay. So did it make it back to the States, or did you ever see it again? Or? I don't know whether it did or not. Okay. One time, I know, somebody was taxing the thing, and it was uh, with number one and four engines. Uh-huh. And uh, number three wasn't working. Of course, they didn't have any brakes or flaps or anything. So it went into a ditch and it wiped out the nose wheel, and they had to repair it. But it repaired and went ahead and flew other missions. But uh, Colonel Fellman, who's dead now, told me about that. And Rang, you know about Rang, the group navigator? Bernie Rang? Bernie Rang. Yes. Did you know his death? No. Well, what happened was Bernie went down to Bomber Command. And uh, as I say, he'd been around the world with... Uh, uh, 
all of the flying group, and he was the chief group navigator and was uh, Calbear's navigator when they went across the flu with Halverson. Right. But he, he was called on to Bomber Command, and a, a new group came across, some colonel that was in charge of it. And Bernie was a good guy. He said, Colonel, he said, uh, you're over here. This is your first mission. He said, I've been on missions up in this area where we're going. He said, uh, if you don't mind, he said, or would like me to. I said, I'll go along with your navigator there. He said, he said the colonel says, oh, I appreciate it, you know. So they went up, and they got a hit by flak and an engine fire. I don't know which engine, on one of the outboard engines, I think. And uh, so Bernie looked up, I guess, and saw this fire, and he and the uh, crew navigator bailed out, and uh, they were over water, and that was the last of them. That was but uh, they got the fire, they blew the fire out and came on back and landed the plane. But uh, that was the way Bernie died, and that, that came from Fellman, too, who was down there in the Bomber Command. Where was Bomber Command in Cairo? Cairo, yeah. Now, was Rickenbacker, not Rickenbacker, uh, Doolittle, was he in charge or was Burton still in no, charge? No, Doolittle came over in 17s. Okay. You know, uh, in North Africa. That's another interesting story. Is we were up in one of the advanced landing grounds there and sleeping in tents and stuff. And Doolittle came in, I guess, in the 17 or something and landed, but it was just about dark, or maybe it was dark, I don't know. Uh-huh. And um, so the uh, one of the guys in our HALPRO was the uh, officer of the day, and he went out to meet him, and he said he couldn't see rank or anything. And he said that this fellow walked towards him, and he had his hand out, and he said, Doolittle's the name. <laughs> 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 he, said, he says, I sh- had to shake hands with him for a good salute. <laughs> And then there was Sir Arthur Tedder that was with the uh, British. That oh, yes. Up there, too. I think he was Eisenhower's um, air chief. When Eisenhower came over to run Operation Torch and um, the Sicily invasion and before he went up to England for uh, for D-Day. Mm-hmm. But uh, interesting. Um, after Halverson left, I guess McGuire became the squadron yeah, commander? Yeah, McGuire. Now, McGuire... Uh, of the two, Fellman was the best liked. McGuire uh, would smoke a cigarette with the holder, you know, and everything. And oh, like FDR? Beg your pardon? Like FDR? Yeah. Frank Roosevelt had yeah, a cigarette yeah. holder. And um, uh, McGuire, another thing, uh, if, a guy, if he was leading the flight, uh, the guys kind of hated to be on it. I mean... Because one time, I know, they were on one. He kept them down there where they were getting shot up and everything. And now, he's dead, too. You know, he, his widow, I guess, is still living. She's a member of the association. Oh, she is? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Her name is in there. Well, let me look here just a minute, but I'm positive. It is. Yeah, here we are. Okay. Mrs. George McGuire. I've even got a phone number and everything on there, too. Okay. You want it? Sure. Okay. I can give you the address and the phone number, too, here, but here's your phone number. Okay. S- area code 650. 650-328-8331. 8331. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, is that coming out of that blue roster? Yeah. Book again? Okay. I'm at- I think I'll have to get myself a copy of that. I only have the latest roster. So, oh, is, was there a later one? That's what I wanted to ask uh, Lapham and forgot to ask him. Uh, I, I'm sure there is. I can I can print you off a copy, and mail it to you. Well, if you wouldn't mind, I mean, because this one of mine is, you know, there's a lot of these people now. She might even be dead because this was before uh, 2002. You know. Sure. But okay. Those no, are I what? can. I can get you a copy. All right, fine. I'd appreciate it. Because I was, yeah. I've, I've, I was also going to, I'm putting together the mission list, and I have one for you, and I'm going to mail it to you because I only have 27 of your 32 missions, so I'm obviously missing some missions that you were on. Mm-hmm. The records back then aren't very complete. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
Well, I, in my diary, if it was up, and I, for some reason or other, I quit my diary. And I think the reason was they sent me down to uh, uh, at the Eritrea there, at that Douglas base, uh-huh. taking an old war weary down there. And I was down there about a month, you know, while it was being uh, air, new engines and everything. Okay. And uh, I quit that. And my last entry was, let's see. No, I don't guess I've got that uh, there, um, when I quit, but uh, I quit. I didn't have any about coming home or any of that stuff, you know. Okay. Um, I have a copy of it. I don't know if this is of your diary. I, I hate to use the word your diary, that uh, Ray Hovis' wife, Grace, typed yeah. up. Yeah, I've got that part, too, that was typed up. That, that goes from May of... 42 to December of 42. Let's see now. Here, let's see. Yeah, December the 29th. Yes. That's yeah. the last entry on this one I have. Yeah. Now, when did you went, when did you go to? You said to Gura. You said you were there a month. I was there at least a month. Yeah. Do you remember which month that was, or approximately when? Mm. Was it like January '43? It probably was. Yeah. Okay. Because according to the mission list I have, there's a big gap from. Yeah. Uh, December of 42. Yeah, I, I regret that I didn't keep that up, but I got down there. Of course, I didn't have, I don't think I had my diary with me even when I took that. So, okay. Well, I will I will send Let's you the roster. That was interesting down there at Eritrea too. I uh, had Ed. Yes. See, that was interesting down at Eritrea. We met a guy there, a little Fiat uh, Italian there that met us. You know. Uh huh. He couldn't speak English. I couldn't speak Italian. Had two other fellows, officers with me there. I think pilot and co-pilot. Uh huh. I mean, and, and that was maybe engineer. And, uh, anyway, it was two other officers. And uh, so I, uh, we were stumbling around, and finally, I, uh, when I was in college, I took two years of Spanish, French. Uh-huh. So I said, uh, "Parlez-vous le français?" And boy, his eyes lit up, and he says, "We," oui, you know. And I <laughs> said, "Je parle un peu," you know, uh, just a little. So, but anyway, we'd worked around there and find out that he had two sons that were in the Italian army, and he hated Mussolini, and one of them had been killed, I guess. And, but it was funny. I mean, and then I was turning around and telling the guys in English what our conversation was. <laughs> I, I said if my college professor, English professor, French professor would have been there, one or two things, he'd either patted me on the back or shot me. <laughs> or failed you. For... I, I was going to say, uh, the 376 bombed uh, the town on Italy that's right across the uh, bay from um, Messina. Mm-hmm. Uh, Riggio de Calabria or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, a couple years ago, I worked with a gentleman who 
whose family was from that town, and he was and he was uh, a little boy. I mean, little. I'm talking like two years old or something when when the when the group bombed his town. He remembers uh-huh. he remembers the Allies bombing his town. Yeah. You were talking about Guri. I, while while we were talking, I went. Somebody wrote a book about Gura, and it has some pictures of some some B-24s in it. Uh-huh. It was called Project. There was the Edna Elizabeth. You remember that plane? Which one? The Edna Elizabeth. That wasn't in our group. I mean, it could have been in the 376, but it wasn't in the original Alpro. Okay, and then there was a, a plane called Jinx. No, that wasn't either. That wasn't either. Okay. I've got the names of all those planes. Okay. Oh, and the original, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, let's see, I'm trying to think. A plane called Congo, or oh, that was a, sorry, Congo Cutie? Nope. Uh, an old Nick? Nope. Okay. Got an old rock. <laughs> now, okay. Listen, did you ever come across a pilot named Uric? U H R I C H. Yeah. I only by name. Yeah, I, I've lost track. I don't know whether he's deceased or not. Um, but he's not in the directory. He never joined the organization. Uh, yeah, he was one of the. Was he? I don't know if he was he an original one or was he a replacement. He, he was. He was original pilot. Okay, let's see. I'm trying to think. That was plane number four, and Old Rock was the ship's name. Right. I've talked with Doug Williams and Dave Tuno, who were yeah, on his crew. Yeah, they were on his crew, yeah. Yes. And let's see, Al Hopkins, I'd talked with him, but he's dead now, too. And uh, He was his navigator. Yes. Uh, but uh, I'm trying to think. Some, I'm trying to think somebody else knew him or flew with him or something that I talked with. I mean, this was in the past mm-hmm. couple of years. But uh, his co pilot was. Uh, Schmidt. Schmidt, yeah. Ferdinand. Ferdinand, Fer- Ferdinand R. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, trying to go over my notes as we were talking. I uh, And the, the other book um, I told you about, Gura, I saw there's a picture of Old Faithful. No, no, that wasn't. Oh, wait a minute, Old Faithful. I... Well, that was number one. Wasn't that... Uh, was that Hal- that was Halverson's group plane or Calbear's plane? Old Faithful, that's right. Yeah, that was yeah. Calbear's plane. Yeah, and the picture uh, of it, it went down to Gura. It did. Mm-hmm. Yes. Alf- Alfred F. Calbear's was his Calbear's full name. He became a general, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he did. He, as I say, he he had quite a flying history, and uh, well, he kind of paved the way to get across. The over through Africa, right? Because because you kind of used the Pan Am. Uh, yeah, yeah. He'd he'd flown he'd flown into Lita even there when we were Palestine, where we were based there. That uh-huh. was an old KLM stop, you know. Sure. Um. Well, I'm I'm kind of running out of things to uh, go through my notes here. Yeah. Well, if you can think of anything else, so if I can answer it, I will. But. Uh, well, I certainly appreciate your taking the time to, to chat with us. Well, I'll tell you, I've got my diary here. I've got these two lists of uh, the original stuff out of Hal Pro, and I've got the history book and the blue uh, uh, membership thing of 2122. Uh-huh. <laughs> Do you, uh, I asked you about pictures of your crew. Do you have any picture, any other pictures of, of any of the men or... Uh, no, I, I don't. I've, let's see what. Because uh, we're trying to. Uh, I know a lot of this material was given to Jim Walker when they wrote the book, and yeah, has made its way to Pima. But um, sometimes uh, some of the people find other things yeah. after the now, fact. Now, what? what uh, tell me this, Ed, if you've got the time. Sure. What? What? What's the the deal now with Ball State and everything on this? It's, I'd read about it in. Uh, the intelligencer, you know, but sure. Well, uh, the w- one of the one of the other sons of one of the other veterans, uh, his name is Dave Ulbrich, uh, is a is a professor at Ball State, mm-hmm. and um, he arranged through Ball State to uh, make video recordings of any of the veterans who came to the 2007 reunion. Mm-hmm. 
And so Dave and I and uh, Kim Hobbs conducted interviews. Mm-hmm. I think there were 44 yeah. veterans. Um, and I'll, bet so you, I bet you had a few Hal Pro, didn't you? Yes. I uh, Al Story and Al Izzo. Yeah. And uh, Barano, was Barano there? No. Yeah. And, well, and he, neither was Doug Williams. But they, yeah. we were going to do that. Well, Doug's wife is di- dead, and uh, I know several years back she died. And uh, um, Baron O, uh, his sons were taking him up there and attending these. Yes. But I guess he's getting too old. To... I had heard he was ill. Yeah. Uh, but I had uh, I asked him uh, if he because he had come to a couple of the other ones, and I asked him if mm-hmm. he was because I definitely wanted to interview. Um, mm-hmm. uh, all the Hal Pro guys. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so we did that, and then uh, then Dave and I and t- uh, talked about well, well, you know, maybe some of the veterans who couldn't make it to the reunion, we could do interviews by telephone. Yeah. And so um, I don't know if Dave has conducted any. Um, Dutch Ebert last week was the first one I've done, and now mm-hmm. you're the number two. And um, what I don't. Well, you know, I was thinking about regular Army. I mean, I was ORC, Officer Reserve Corps, uh-huh. rather than AUS. <clears throat> and uh, I got a letter from uh, uh, Sanders, uh, who ended up in the Pentagon. I think he was a colonel, too. Uh-huh. And uh, But he they, he got pulled out of Al Pro oh, by Dick 376 and became a some colonel or general over in Europe knew him and as a B-26 pilot and wanted him over there, you know. You're talking about, you're talking about Richard Sanders? Richard C. Sanders, yeah. Yes. He became the youngest brigadier general in the, uh, on yeah. the Air Corps, I believe. And you heard what happened to him? No. Oh, boy. Now, this is what I get from, uh, I think it was Swanebeck, one of the guys that lived near him. But he was at uh, the, uh, now, this isn't. I, I'm, this is hearsay as far as I'm concerned. Sure. And I was an FBI agent, so you know what I think of hearsay. Yeah. But uh, uh, as I understand it, he took his own life with really? a gun there. He, uh, I don't know whether it was at the Pentagon or not, but uh, he I guess he had about two desks or three of it and phones ringing all the time and stuff. And You don't know what happens in a case like that, but... Old uh, Dick Sanders and and he and Payne were close friends. Well, Payne, Johnny, Payne was killed up over Naples. On yeah, uh, Payne was also a well beloved member, as I understand it. Was what a well beloved, respected. Yeah, member he of, was. Yeah, Johnny Payne. Yeah, uh, he had, he flew Black Mariah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Apparently, he had a car named Black Mariah. So Is that right? Him. Well, there's a, another B twenty four historian named Al Blue. Here, here, here's another one I wanted to ask you about too. Sure. Paul Paul Davis. Now he was the first pilot, and he was a uh, major. That's another name, but I've I've never talked with him. Well, and I just wonder if he's alive too. Right. I think I'm the senior uh, agent now alive that was in that. Uh, I was a squadron combat squadron commander over there when I left. You know. Yeah. But I think that uh, I'm probably the. Uh, Ranking member? Ranking member that's still living. Okay. Because Calbear and uh, Fellman and... Uh, uh, well, Rice is still with us, but he wasn't a pilot. Who's I mean, that? Scotty Rice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I talked with Scotty one time, waiting on an airplane, and some player we were delayed, and his dad was a general. Right. Yeah. And he, Scotty lives in Galveston. He does, huh? Yes. Yeah. Uh, or somewhere in that neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, one of the interesting things about the internet now is you can type in people's names, and um, every once in a while you get a hit. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times they'll they'll give the age of a, of a person. And you say, well, he's in the right age group. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, there was a B twenty four pilot by the name of Fountain, mm-hmm. and uh, I did a search on him, and there is a Mr. Fountain living. He was, I think, he's ninety years old, and he lives down in Florida somewhere. So Fountain, Fountain. that name rings a bell. It's, First name is Willard. Mm-hmm. To, but yeah. uh, so I've been. Well, you know, to... I never did get a computer, and the reason was that uh, just like you say that internet. But when I witnessed that autopsy there at Bethesda on Kennedy, you know, I had uh, heard you were you were there. 
Oh, yeah, I was one of the two agents. I was a senior resident agent there at Hyattsville, and uh, that's where Andrews Air Force is located. And, of course, the body was flown into Andrews. Right. And uh, so we, we, I got in a motorcade and went over to uh, two of us, so me and O'Neill, witnessed the whole thing there at Bethesda, the Naval Center. So you saw actually saw the autopsy? Oh, yeah, I witnessed the whole thing. I've oh, been I before two uh, uh, deposition groups up there, the... Um, Assassination uh, Review Board, and uh, I forget what the other one's name. But I, I mean, guess I should ask you: Do you believe there was only one assassin? I, I've got my doubts on that. I mean, I don't have any proof, but but uh, stuff that on the autopsy and the way they switched it around, and you talk about something botched, and I'm on record on this: that that autopsy was the biggest botched thing I've ever seen. Well, I know there was. Recently, down here, because we live in Dallas, and recently one of the Dallas doctors who, I guess they yanked them off of the autopsy, I guess... McClellan, was that... I don't remember his name, but he, apparently they were about ready to start doing something, and the and the federal, I don't know people, I don't know who they were, if it was FBI or Secret Service, somebody came in and stopped them, and then took the body out to Love Field, and of course then they flew the body yeah. back. Well, to- see... And he, the, 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 well, I'll tell you what stopped it probably was Bobby Kennedy sitting back in Washington, the Attorney General, the number one law enforcement officer in the nation, uh-huh. and that's his brother. Right. And uh, he's the one that uh, gave orders. This, by all rights, this autopsy should have been done in in Texas. Right. Because Texas has a state law that any murder committed there, the autopsy has to be done there. Right. And but, at that time, killing a president was not a federal crime. That's right, and the FBI had no jurisdiction. We had no uh, 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 laws or ju- right. federal jurisdiction to conduct it, and our hands were tied. I mean, there at Bethesda. Now, uh, they didn't call the doctors at Bethesda when they got the body, and here was a tracheotomy that had been done over at Parkland and everything. That, that was the first thing they should have done is called Parkland and said, look, what did you do over there? We've got the body here now, and we're going to do an autopsy, but what, what can you tell us? Right. But you had a civilian hospital in Parkland, and you had a federal one, naval one in there, and I think that maybe there wasn't a rapport that you should normally have, you know. Right. But uh, good night. Uh, then when they finally did get around to calling Saturday morning after the bodies and possession of the funeral director, they said, well, you know where we made that autopsy, I mean, made that uh, incision for the uh, 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 you know, in the throat right? to sustain life. They said that was... Tracheotomy. Over, yeah, tracheotomy. That's what I was trying to think of. But they said it was over what we think was a bullet entrance. Oh. Because of the smoothness of the way that it went in. Yeah. And uh, so when they had already, Humes there at Bethesda, the commander Humes had already made up his notes and everything, and here you had another bullet that you hadn't accounted for, you know. And I say this thing was just a lot of stuff. They sent the clothing into the FBI of one place, sent the body into another. They could have had uh, the coat and the shirt. They could have measured the uh, bullet holes in sure. the, both of those and compared them. Uh, and then the automobile, they didn't... Uh, keep it there and they flew it out and you had all these chips and stuff that uh, were the bullets that hit it, you know. It, it almost makes it sound like somebody was trying to make sure it got botched. Yeah, I'll tell you, it was, it's, I said of all things, the President of the United States in an autopsy that was botched like that with Oh, and Austin Humes, you know, and uh, and Boswell, the two guys that were Bethesda, really they weren't up to date on gunshot Wound shot, gunshot pathology. Uh huh. But now they had a place right there, the uh, uh, near uh, uh, Walter Reed Hospital, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, uh-huh. that uh, does does this kind of stuff. And you know, if they'd have gone to Reed, even and the guy that Hume said when he found out he was going to do it at Bethesda says, "What in the world are they sending the body in here for?" You know. Huh. So yeah, was, I'll tell you, it's pathetic. Interesting. Well. Uh, much after Hal Pro. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I think I've run out of questions to ask. Well, I've asked you some here about guys that I'd lost track of. and uh, Well, uh, 
definitely going to stay in touch. Yeah, okay. I will send you the information I have, including the roster. Yeah, and the mission list, and and you uh, got my full address, haven't you? Oh uh, no, but you can give it to me just in case. 